we were looking at this little book of Philippians, and it's, a, it's one of my favorite letters in the, in the whole book of the Bible. And so we're going to dig in today, go a little bit further into my very favorite part of the book of Philippians, and it's probably your favorite part too. And so we'll look at that a little bit in just a minute. But first, let's take a look at this, and let's get a little political this morning. I don't like to get involved in politics, but this morning we're going there. We are going there, okay? When you look at this picture of these two guys, don't you think these are the most humble guys in the world? I might have to take my mask off because my glasses are fogging up as I'm speaking. I'll just do it like this, okay. I mean, they are the epitome of humble leadership. What what great humility. You know, they have intentionally debased themselves. They've intentionally lowered themselves to be servants. And they have always put each other first. There's even a rumor that they went to Camp David and had this retreat where they washed each other's feet. Yeah, nobody believes that, do we? These guys are not known for humility. They are not known for, I got to take this off because I am seriously fogging up. I can't see anything. They're not known for that. In fact, I could put several different politicians up here and we would all say, those guys aren't known for humility. They're known for grabbing at power, grabbing for attention and prestige. They want to be seen. They want to be noticed. They want to get their message across. But isn't that how our American political system is set up to begin with? I mean, I can't really blame these guys. That's just how it is. And you know what? Let's be honest. We like it that way. We like our leaders to take charge. We want leaders who stand up and fight and push, well, as long as it's on as they agree with us, Right? If they're on our side of the aisle, then go, go, go. If you're on the other side, shut up and sit down, all right? So, you know, we feed this, this, this political system that is ours. And you know what? The first century and the ancient world, even before the first, first century, was no different than our time today. This guy right here, Alexander the Great. Now, he was 300-something years before Christ was born, but, you know, by the age of 21, he conquered all of Greece. And then he set his sights on the whole world, the whole rest of the known world. And guess what? He did it. I mean, he defeated every part of the known civilization at, at that time, of Greece and Europe and that whole area. He did it. And so it was kind of natural for people to look at his conquests and say, he must be a god now, he died at an early age, and before he died, uh, he started calling himself. He started buying into the hype and called himself the son of Zeus, the Greek omnipotent god, Zeus. He started calling himself, I'm the son of Zeus. He bought it. And the, the, the people said, yes, he's got to be a god. If nothing else, he's a demigod. And they worshiped him, and they admired him, and they honored him. No humility, just it's all about me. Well, that's 300 years before Christ, but of course we know there are other great Roman leaders. This is Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar was formally, after he died, was formally deified as the divine Julius. That was his title, divine Julius. And uh, we know he had an ego the size of his empire, and he had a son. His son, Octavius, was, became known as Augustus. And Augustus, this is a denaria, denarii from that time with his image, Caesar Augustus' image. And over here, it says divine son or son of God. This is what he was known as. He bought into the hype. He published it. The, the, the imperial the Roman Empire knew him as the divine son. All right, let's keep going. Because in Paul's day, when he's writing this letter, all this was before Paul, right? In Paul's day, when he writes this letter to the Philippians, Nero is emperor. And what about Nero? 
Well, Nero erected this huge bronze sculpture of himself. It was 103 feet tall. The Statue of Liberty is 111 feet tall. That's how big this thing was. And it was eventually moved outside the Colosseum in Rome. And some of you have been there, but you know how huge that structure is. Look at the size compared to the Colosseum. This became known as the Colossus of Nero because it was so big and it was eventually placed next to the Colosseum. Do you see humility here? I mean, he's got this, this scepter here, but it's an anchor, and it's sitting on top of the globe. And what he's saying is, I am divine over the seas and the world. Not much humility there. This is the culture in which the Philippians, uh, who are receiving Paul's letter, live. And they're used to their leaders being pompous. And taking on these divine titles and the, and the culture around them mainly buys into this idea that these guys are gods or s- demigods. And we're guilty of the same thing. We take our leaders, they don't have to be political leaders, they, they could be other kinds of leaders, and we elevate them to these statuses, to really to the point where some people were actually in some ways worshiping them and so we can we can see where the philippians are coming from but paul has been telling them that is not how it is with us that's not how it's supposed to be jesus of nazareth did not lead this way jesus of nazareth is the opposite of these kinds of leaders jesus of nazareth is the epitome i mean he was of humility he was humble he was even homeless Right? He, he traveled a uh, very few miles away from his home. And of course, we know some of the teachings and examples of Jesus. Look at what he says in Mark 10. You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. Yes, they know this. They've experienced it firsthand. And their great ones exercise authority over them. Yes, they know that for sure firsthand. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man, that's Jesus, even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. And to give his life as a ransom for many. We could go on and on with the stories of Jesus and his teachings and, and the stories. One of the best stories that really illustrates his humility is when um, at the, the Last Supper, Jesus sent disciples ahead to secure the room, to prepare the, the, the Passover meal. But those guys forgot, I guess, to make arrangements for a servant or a slave to wash people's feet. And so they're all coming into the table, they're reclining at the table, and nobody has washed their feet. So Jesus, the Son of God, takes off his outer garment, puts a towel around his waist, and humbles himself. He stoops so low to wash dirty feet. Now, you have to know that the Midrash, which is a, a commentary on, on the Torah, on Jewish, it's a Jewish commentary on the Jewish scriptures said that washing feet was the lowest job of the low that no Hebrew even a Hebrew slave should be commanded to wash people's feet it was reserved for children and Gentiles and here's Jesus humiliating himself and washing people washing his disciples feet this is a great example of humility Here's another way of looking at our images of leadership. You may not be used to seeing this picture this way because this is not how this picture looks today. This picture was painted by Ford Maddox Brown, and this was the original. And it hung this way. It was on sale for a long time, but nobody wanted it because they saw Christ in such a humiliating way with no clothes on. 
It says he removed his garment, right? He put a towel around his waist. But no one, they thought it was obscene that Jesus would look this way. And so the artist had to go back and put clothes on Jesus before it was accepted and bought finally. So this is the epitome of humility. Here's what the scriptures say about it. Jesus said after he washed their feet, he said, If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than he who sent him. So we have Jesus living that example of humility. Now, last week, we looked at uh, the end of chapter 1, verses 27, all the way through the beginning of the first few scriptures of chapter 2. And in here, it talks about how we should live lives worthy of the gospel. Do you remember that? And that we looked at that and said, that means you're a citizen of heaven. You should live as citizens of heaven in this world. And how do you do that? Well, Paul says in chapter 2, verses 2 through 4, how do you do this? You do this by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full, full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you not only look to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. So this is how you do it. This is how you live a life that's worthy of the Gospels. And in your relationships with one another is where this is played out. And we said last week, Paul is dealing with some kind of disunity in the church. There's something going on, or maybe several things going on, where people are not working together. They're not in unity. They're not in harmony. And so he says, you know what? The problem is pride and self-centeredness. You guys have to put the others first. Look out to others' interests before your own, right? We've got to have, you can't have unity with this stuff going on. And he says, the way to have unity is through humility and selflessness. That is the key to having unity. And remember he says, last week we said, unity is the key for advancing the gospel around in the world around you. The world around you has to look at the church and see unity and love. And that's how the, advance, the gospel advances. But also, it's key for your own church, for your relationships, for the, your own unity and your own progress in spiritual development you cannot grow spiritually mature if you are in disunity with your brothers and sisters if you're full of pride and self-centeredness you it's going to destroy your relationships we see this in marriages all the time marriages that fail think about marriages that have failed which one characterized them everyone i know there was pride and or self-centeredness that destroyed that relationship. Yes? Do you agree with me? Zoom people, do you agree with me? Pride and self-centeredness is what destroys relationships in the church and marriages, and humility and selflessness is what builds relationships. All relationships, marriage, church, you name it. So Paul is saying you gotta have unity, you gotta have unity, and what follows is a beautiful poem in verses 6 through 11 of the second chapter of Philippians. It is an ancient poem. Now some people think that Paul quotes this hymn that has been previously written. A hymn that has been sung in the churches he's already started. And he's just bringing it into this context. Maybe it was written by someone else. Some people think, well no, Paul wrote this, but he wrote it as a beautiful hymn. It is a poem or it is a hymn. If you look at the structure, you look at all the details, it is some kind of poem. Okay, it's, it's not just prose. He inserts this, and to introduce it, he says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. And so, this being probably a poem or a hymn that the churches were familiar with, that they would recite, maybe they even sang it. Maybe it was put to music. We don't know. I'm going to ask you to stand, and let's recite this 
ancient Christian poem together. Those of you who are worshiping with us at home, we want you to also speak it out loud, even though it may feel, feel weird. If you're the only one in the room or there's two of you in the room, we want you to speak this out loud, okay? So let's say this together. This is talking about Christ, right? Ready? Who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You be seated. Thank you for that. So let's just examine this poem, this ancient poem. Now, there's a lot here, and theologians for over the centuries have written libraries full of books just on the concepts that we find here in this ancient poem. Now, Paul, Paul is not trying to, he's not trying to explain all these things. He just says that's how it is, right? And he, it serves a purpose. His purpose is mainly as an example to, for them to follow. But there's so much here, we can't just leave it like that. We're, we're going to break it down a little bit and, on these different phrases and, because it has so much to do with our understanding of who Christ is and how the whole kingdom of God works. So let's look at this. Number one, we get the idea here and from some other places in Scripture that Christ was God before he became, came to earth. He was God, and he was equal to God. Look what it says in verse Six, he says, who being in the very nature of God. In other words, his essence, his character, everything about him was God. And he did not consider this equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Some verses say to be be grasped or clasped, to be held on to tightly. In other words, he says, he was equal with God. He was God in his who he was in his nature, in his very essence, Christ was God. Now, there are a lot of people who say, and there's still books coming out about this today, that the early Christians never said that Jesus was God. This is something that developed centuries later, three and four hundred years after the first century. And they say, kind of like the Caesars, the emperors, how their reputation built to the point of eventually people said, oh, they must be a god. They say this is what happened to Christians in three and 400 years later. This is evidence right here. This is one of the earliest poems we, that has ever been written about Christ. And it says it plainly right there, what was accepted already about Jesus. He was God. And he had the nature of God in his essence. And he was equal with God. It's right there in our face. Not only that, Christ was eternal. Because this is talking about when Jesus was with God in heaven. Before he became a man. He was, Jesus was pre-existent. He existed before he became a man. So this is a huge theological points here about who Jesus is. So Jesus, his humility is eternal. He is eternal, and his humility is eternal. He didn't become humble when he became a man. Jesus, because he's in the very nature of God and equal with God, was already filled with humility. Humility is a characteristic of God. Now, we usually don't think that way, do we? The almighty, the all-powerful, the omniscient God of the universe is humble? But this says it plainly. God, Jesus, were humble. Even before Jesus became a man, he was humble. And he didn't consider this equality with God. He let it go. 
He didn't see something he had to hold on to, but he let it go. And then we see that he made himself nothing. Rather, he made himself nothing. He let go of equality with God and made himself nothing. One version, a lot of versions actually say, this is more literal, he emptied himself. Well, then we have to ask the question, what did he empty himself of? What do you think Christ emptied himself of? Did he empty himself of uh, his power, his ability to do miracles? Did he empty himself of uh, glory, of position, of what did he empty himself of? This is the question we have to ask. What did Jesus empty himself of? Did he empty himself of the divine nature of his divinity? Did he empty himself of, his, of the divine powers like omniscience and omnipotence and omnipresence? What did he empty himself of his rights? What did he empty himself of? And I think the best way to answer this is that he emptied himself or made himself nothing by emptying himself. Him, he took his self and he emptied it. He submitted his self to the will of God. In a lot of ways, he submitted himself to the will of man by becoming man and serving man. He emptied himself of himself. He poured out himself totally to be at our disposal. Even if we were to mistreat him, he emptied himself. You can't really say he definitively emptied himself of all his powers because he did miracles, right? You can't say he def uh, emptied himself totally of his knowledge, his omniscience, because he knew things that other people didn't know. Now, some people say, and this is kind of what I think, that he did empty himself of all that stuff. And any of that that came to him while on earth to do miracles, to know things that other people didn't know, came to him, I think, in the moment by the power of the Spirit. That he was truly a man. Truly a man while truly being God. Here's another way of looking at it. He didn't empty himself of being God. He actually was fully God and he emptied himself by adding to God humanity. So he's fully God and fully man, if that makes any sense at all. In some ways, some, one commentator said he was God, but when he became man, he became more than God, if that's even possible. Because he added to his Godness his humanness. Does that make sense? He emptied himself of himself to serve and he became a slave so just like it says he was in the very nature of God in his essence he was God then it says he took the very nature of a servant so his essence was a servant a slave that's another way to to interpret this Greek word doulos is servant or slave in his essence he was a slave he was essence was God, but in his essence, he was also a slave. And he became human, being made in human likeness, being found in the appearance of a man. Now, there's been a lot of interpretation of this throughout the centuries where people had a view where they said, well, Jesus didn't really become man. He only had the appearance of a man. He only appeared in human likeness. This being made defeats that uh, logic. Because in heaven, he was, his being was the very nature of God. It's the same idea here. He was really his being. He was born of a woman in human likeness. He was, he was made a man. He was, his being eternally is God, but he was made a man. So he became human. Now, Paul doesn't explain all this stuff. He just misses it, and they just go right on. And he humbled himself. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. How much more humility can a person have than to willingly die for someone? And you got to remember that crucifixion, according to Jewish law, anyone who was crucified on the tree was cursed 
by God. That is the lowest of the low. And even Romans, the Roman, you know, the Persians are the one who invented the crucifixion. The Romans perfected crucifixion. But even in Roman society, you could not mention the cross or crucifixion because it was considered obscene. You didn't talk about it. It was just something that was so low and disgusting, reserved only for the murderers, the assassins, for those who were uh, causing a rebellion, and for slaves. It was the lowest form of punishment in the Jewish world and the Roman world. It's one thing to humble yourself to die for someone. It's a total another thing to humble yourself to the point of being crucified in such an obscene way. That's verses 6 through 8. In verses 9, there's a turnaround. There's a change. In verse 9, it totally shifts gears. In verse 9, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So we've had this descent from verses 6 through 8. He descended from his heavenly heights and his glorious existence as God, and he humbles himself, becomes a man, not just a man, a slave. And he humbles himself and submits himself to dying, but not just dying, to the very lowest death, crucifixion. And this is something he has done himself. Christ made those decisions. He made himself nothing. He he became a man. He made himself a slave. He put himself under submission, under obedience to the point of dying. These are things that Christ did. These are self-initiated things by Christ. But then... In verse 9, God steps in. And God the Father, nothing is here that says what Christ did. This is all about what God did for Christ. Right? It's the great reversal. And God steps in. God the Father steps in and he exalts Jesus. It's like, like a catapult. You know how, how you do a catapult? You load it and you start cranking it and lower. And that arm goes lower little bit by little bit and that tension grows. Right? This is the lowering of Christ in humility and death. And then somebody trips the mechanism, and what does it do? Immediately. And this is the exaltation of Christ. He has lowered himself through his life on earth, becoming a slave and human, and humiliation and death. And then, at the resurrection, bam! Jesus is exalted. And the name of Jesus is, the high, is made the highest name above every other name. And not just his resurrection, but he's ascended to heaven. And he sits on the throne right next to God the Father. And God the Father has turned over to him complete control. That every name, every person, every tongue is going to confess that Jesus is Lord. And every knee is going to bow to this mighty, supreme God of the universe. Jesus. Some would even say that the name that is above every name is Lord. You got to know your Greek to know this and some Hebrew too. When you look at the Hebrew scriptures of the Old Testament, when they're converted into Greek, which is what everybody read back then, was the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures of the Old Testament. This word Lord appeared every time when the real word was Yahweh, the personal name for God. The word Lord appeared. In Greek, it was kurios, which means Lord. This is the word kurios here. So some people are saying that Jesus Christ is actually given the name, the personal name for God, Yahweh. That is something right there. Because God has said in the Old Testament, I will not share my glory with anyone I want, my name is above all names. The name Yahweh is above. And here is Yahweh sharing his glory with his son, the eternal Christ. Others say, well, actually it's the name Jesus that is lifted above every name. I, I tend to agree with both these people because Jesus is the name that is above all names. And now he has this title to go with it. Jesus Christ is Yahweh. There is no higher name. 
He went for, talk about a rags to riches story. So why is Paul telling this in this, in this Philippian letter of, uh, you know, I want you guys to get along, I want you to be united. You, there's too much pride, too much self-centeredness. You need to be united. You need to be humble. You need to be self-sacrificing. Well, there it is right there. Paul says, I want you to have the same mind, mindset that is in Christ Jesus. In other words, we need to imitate Jesus. And he tells the story of Jesus. And he wants us, the Philippians and us today, to imitate, to follow the example of Jesus, to humiliate, to allow ourselves to be humiliated. Some of this, this is going to rub some of you the wrong way. To allow, allow ourselves to be stepped upon. To become doormats. We don't like that, right? We like to say, oh, you can humble yourself and serve people, but don't let people walk on you. Don't let people tread on you. Don't let. If we follow the example of Jesus, what choice do we have? That is a hard message for the Philippians to hear because they're used to leadership that is strong. Leadership that is assertive, full of pride, and pomp, and prestige, and so are we. And we like that about ourselves. No one likes to humiliate themselves and put themselves at other people's disposal to do whatever they want. But this is the example Paul is saying that we need to have if we're going to follow the example of Christ That's not an easy message to hear. So he tells them this because he wants them to follow the example of Christ. I think he also wants to remind them that this Christ who we follow is also the one who is worthy to be worshipped. It's an encouragement to follow the example of Christ. It's also an encouragement to remember who you are and who Christ is. I think both those things go right together. The law of the kingdom of God is this, that self-humbling leads inevitably to exaltation. That is a law of the kingdom of God. It's all throughout the Old Testament. It's all throughout the New Testament. Jesus said over and over, he said things like, the greatest among you will be your servant. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Does that sound familiar? That's exactly what happened to Jesus, isn't it? Here's just another one. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. That is the unalterable law of the kingdom of God. It's the upside-down kingdom. It's the upside-down way of looking at life. And Paul's, one of Paul's main purposes in this letter is to get the Philippians to think differently. Don't think like the world around you, Philippians, the Roman world around you and the pagans who put themselves first and, you know, besides worshiping false gods and everything else, they are full of pride. They're full of arrogance. He says you've got to think differently now that you follow Christ. And this is the message for you and I today. We need to think differently if we're going to follow Christ. We can't let the culture's values determine how we think and how we act. It's the kingdom of God and this irreversible law that we must adhere to. The example of Jesus, of being humble, that is where we're going. That is the purpose. Why did Paul put this in here? I think it's for two purposes, or maybe three. He wants to remind them that this is how you're supposed to live. You imitate Christ. Humble yourselves. To the point even of the greatest humility. Follow Christ. If you want to have unity in your church, in your relationships, we have to be following the example of Christ. And I think he tells them, remember they're under some kind of oppression here. Some kind of persecution by the culture. Some people are attacking them for their faith and their ways of following Jesus. He said, look, I think this is a way of encouraging them. Yes, when you, when you humiliate yourselves, when you humble yourselves, you're going to get hurt. People are going to walk on you. But know this, that God the Father who exalted Christ like a catapult to the highest place is also going to exalt you, not to the highest place, 
and your name is not going to be above every other name. And sorry, every tongue is not going to confess and knees are not going to bow to you. But as followers of Christ, we too, when we live that humble life, are going to be exalted by God. So take heart, persevere. So that's the second reason. And that third reason is just to remind them of who they worship. They don't worship a man, a dead Jew. They worship a risen Savior, the Savior of the world. And those are three great messages for us today. That example to follow, that encouragement to persevere, and a reminder of who we worship and how great Christ is. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this reminder from Paul to the Philippians and a reminder that we can take home today. Thank you, God, for this great ancient poem that still speaks to us today. And Father, I pray that those who hear this message will take this example of following Christ to heart. We will do self-examination and see what parts of my life do I need to turn over, to let go of, to not grasp so tightly to, but to freely let go of and humble ourselves. And how can we take this message to give us encouragement that we may be feeling oppressed and things aren't going our way and we're feeling like people are taking advantage of us? Remind us, God, that this is the way of Christ. This is the way of suffering. But you have great plans for us in store for us that you are going to exalt us and bring us home to be with you. And help us to remember on a daily basis, God, that as we follow the example of Christ, as we remember where we're headed, that this image of Christ will continue to be on our hearts and minds as we worship this great, exhausted, exalted, supreme being of the entire universe. And let us not wait until this life is over to confess the name of Jesus and to bow the knee before Jesus, but do it now. And right now we confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And I pray this in Christ's name. Amen.